solving, adapting, problem solving, creating problem solving, visualizing, etc. And, and for, for that, that, you have, you have to have learn learning habits, habits of mind. You must be curious. You must be open-minded. You must be resourceful. You must learn how to collaborate. You should all all this with ethical considerations. So, Genex engineers, I propose to you, will fall into the five categories. The first is they'll have to be responsible engineers. Second, they will have to be borderless. Third, they will have to be solution engineers. Fourth, they have to be assured engineers, and I'll explain to you what assured means. And finally, they have to be Gandhian engineers. Now, some of these terms will be familiar to you, some of these will not be, and I will explain each one of them. You know, we had this lecture by Lord Martin Rees, the president of Raj Society in 2007. I was then the president of Indian National Science Academy. And the title of his talk was The Last Century Will the Civilization Survive the 21st Century? And why did he say that? Because he had deep concerns about climate change, global warming, stratospheric ozone layer depletion, ravaging of biodiversity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, as engineers, are we mitigating or adding to these? Is the fundamental question that we have to ask. This is the scene from the Bhopal disaster and the gas tragedy, 26,000 people died. And I remember being there just uh, uh, after 72 hours after the accident had taken place and 2,600 people had died. I was appointed the technical assessor for the inquiry commission. And we should all say to ourselves, never again will we make it happen. I was also, you can see me here, when the Maharashtra gas cracker complex accident took place in 1992, almost 30 years ago, I was appointed the chairman of the inquiry committee. So as luck would have it, two of India's worst disasters have been involved in its investigation. Now, sustainable energy future is what we talked about. That means low carbon economy, no carbon economy, carbon neutral home. And therefore, as responsible engineers, we have to make sure that we contribute to this. Now, are we doing something about this in India? I remember when I was the director general of CSIR, we created what is called as a New Millennium Indian Technology Leadership Initiative, year 2000, where we were looking at future. For example, India had always operated here, where markets were certain and technology was certain. Here, we dare and we say, we will we'll look at something where markets are not certain, technology is not certain. And now everybody talks about hydrogen, but it was in 2002 that we started the program on hydrogen in a proactive way. And you can see its effect today. This is Dr. Ashish Lele, who spearheaded the program. KPIT Technology Chairman, uh, Mr. Ravi Pandit, and myself, very proudly standing before this bus, which has the first indigenously developed hydrogen fuel cell bus. We launched it in December 2021. And this was a partnership between KPIT Technology, National Chemical Laboratory, Central Electrochemical Research Institute, it was a Team India effort. And this technology would cost $400 per kilowatt compared to globally 1,000 to 1,200 kilowatt. And that's the point I always like to make, that we will be always a low-cost nation, but very high quality, affordable excellence, as we know. <laughs> and now, of course, we are taking this forward. Uh, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, Chairman of Reliance Innovation Council, for example. He and I had a fireside chat just a few months ago, and he declared that he will produce one kilogram of green hydrogen for one dollar in one decade. I can assure you 
This is the toughest target that anybody has set. And he also has a dream that we can export half trillion dollar green energy to the world rather than being an importing country. What am I trying to say? That we have these aspirations of doing something where nobody in the world has done. And I chair this new energy council. I hello. happen to be. Uh, hello? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. You were saying something? Oh, no, sir. You can continue. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the words, some of the top experts are members, and we are driving this. The sense I want to give you is that India is not necessarily a follower, it will be leaders around the world. So I explained it to you, responsible engineers, by describing to you what we'll be doing in terms of climate change, what we'll be doing in terms of green energy, because the future lies in green hydrogen. And secondly, we have to talk about borderless engineers. And I remember giving this talk in London, seamless chemical engineering science, the emerging paradigm, and where you can see this was a paper I wrote in Harvard. And you can see here, this is biology inspired engineering, creating a reported nanoparticle, uh, which reports back the efficacy in real time. And if you see the partnerships here, they're from seven different disciplines. So that's exactly what I'm talking about, breaking borders between different disciplines. And if you see, for example, this three-dimensional interviewing of biology and electronics to create a bionic ear using 3D printing, there are several different, uh, uh, let's say, fields, whether it is biology, whether it is materials engineering, whether it is electronics, all working together. Gen X engineers, having talked about responsible and borderless, we must look at solution engineers. What does solution engineer mean? Now, here is a brilliant example of a solution engineer. Here is a challenge that uh, this po uh, poor uh, person has who has only one catering, but he has to serve five people. And what does he do? He creates a solution because he can't employ more people. So in one kettle, he's able to fill five hoses, to fill five cups of tea at a given time. So he was faced with a problem and he found a solution. This is the characteristics of an engineer. He is never a part of a problem. He is always a part of a solution. And just look at uh, Ford Motors. You know, uh, when... Uh, Henry Ford started his factory, the cars were very expensive. And then he went to a slaughterhouse and found that different parts of the animals were being assembled in an assembly line approach. And he drew inspiration from that. And then Ford Motors moved to an assembly line approach. And the net result of that was the price of the car dropped dramatically. Now, you might say, what is the connection between a slaughterhouse and a manufacturing plant for the car? But he found the similarity and created a solution. So that is the kind of quality an engineer has to have. I'll give you an example from Mudit Dandavate, mechanical engineering IIT Bombay. He was a co-founder of Turtle Shell Technologies. And in my mother's name, I have this Anjani Mashalka Inclusive Innovation Award. In 2020, he won that. So what did he do? He was actually employed in a car factory. And his job was to do vibration analysis to find out the health of the car. What he did was, if we can do the vibration analysis, for a car and find its health, why can't we do it for a human being? And therefore, he created this mozi, which actually monitors the micro average in your body. And uh, as I said, the inspiration for this came from automobile days. They use vibration sensors to check the health of a car. So he created this uh, award, uh, which was a contactless health monitor, which he converted into dozi. So here is your bed, 
And this is an IoT-based sensor system, which you can push under the bed. And it's a continuous contact-free wireless monitor, basically, and can measure seven parameters at 98.4% accuracy and 20 times cheaper than the products used in ICU. No maintenance, no consumables, no prior technical expertise. And it has been used all over India during the COVID times. And you can see the advantage of this, that a nurse doesn't have to spend 50 minutes per patient per day, but can do it in 10 minutes. And what it means is that for one job uh, uh, that you require five nurses, you can do it with one nurse. And that's a tremendous benefit. And now this product is going global. Solution engineer, for example, termite-inspired natural air conditioning, you know, the way termites build uh, these systems, based on that, actually, some architects and civil and structural engineers started building a new design, for example. Or, for example, the shipworm eating into the wood and leaving behind the residue to keep the shipworm. That principle was used to create a tunneling shield, creating a residue-based wall to protect the structure during the tunneling operation, as you can see. The solution engineering, therefore, is one engineering. All right. What it means is that it's not going to be mechanical, electrical, civil, uh, chemical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What you have to see is that what is the problem, and we want to find a solution, and where all these individual disciplines will merge. That is the way the new mindset has to be there. So I've talked about responsible engineers. I've talked about borderless engineers. I've talked about solution engineers. Now let us talk about assured engineers. This is a new term for you. I've been on the board of Reliance, our biggest enterprise, for 17 years now. I've just stood down. And Mukesh Ambani had said that growth is life. That was uh, the motto of the organization. As you can see, they have grown enormously. Tens of thousands of folks in just uh, uh, for of, of 40 plus years. And there, he created an innovation council under my chairmanship. And we said innovation has to be a way of life. And if you combine the two, then it becomes innovation-led growth. All right? And the growth has to be exponential. So innovation can't be uh, just incremental. It has to be exponential. And one day, when Mukesh Bhai and I were talking, he talked about leapfrogging. And then we thought, uh, hold on a minute, let us seriously think about leaf frog. Why does the frog leap? The frog leaps because he is afraid of the predators. He is afraid of the enemy, and he jumps a few feet. So, should we be doing that, or should we be doing pole vaulting? Because the size of the pole is the size of your aspiration, and you can go very far. And you can see what Reliance has done as far as uh, mobile telephony is concerned. Uh, in terms of the mobile data consumption, we are here behind the rest of the world. And after Geo came, you can see we did not leapfrog from 155th to 100th position. We pole vaulted from 155th to number one position. And if you see, we require a paradigm shift in Indian innovation strategy, not following, not fast following, not leading, not leapfrogging, but we need pole vaulting. And this pole vaulting has to result in not just revolution, uh, 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 must result into revolution, not just renovation. It has to be new to the world, not just company. We have to get unprecedented cost performance features and entirely new products and services. And finally, we have to create next practice, not just best practice. Now, what do I mean by that? We always take pride in the fact that, oh, in my company, we follow best practice. 
But when we say follow based factory, that means you are a follower. You have to become a leader. And how do you become a leader? You go beyond the best practice and create your own practice, which is better than the best practice, which is the next practice. And this is what we have said in our book, Leapfrogging to Pole Vaulting, uh, which came up in 2019 and got the best business book of the year award. And if you see, India has been pole vaulting in the last decade. What does pole vault mean? You achieve things with great speed, you achieve them at great scale, you make a big impact. For example, we have done world's fastest and largest financial inclusion through Jandan Yojana, Aadhaar, and mobile. We have done world's fastest and largest jump in mobile data consumption, as we saw. We have done world's fastest and largest digital payments. We are number one today. China is number two. World's fastest and largest deployment of light emitting dyers. Within seven years, we moved from 0.2% market share to 88%. That's a world record. So India has done it. And can we do world's fastest and largest sustainable transformation? Of course we can. And that is the confidence, that is the responsibility of Gen X engineers. In fact, General Bipin Rawat, unfortunately, is no more chief of defense staff. When he read the book, Leaf Rogging to Pole Vaulting, uh, and he has given an interview, you can find it on the YouTube, where he said, time has come to move from leaf frogging to pole vaulting. So the Gen X engineers have to be pole vaulters. They should not be frogs. Now, the issue is when you pole vault, you go to a big height and then you come down. How do you make sure that you don't break your bones? So here is a framework that if you are doing assured innovation, then you are guaranteed not to break your bones. And what is that? That means the innovation that you do has to be affordable, so a large number of people can use it. It has to be scalable. It should not just spread to 10 people or 10,000 or 10 million. It must go to hundreds of millions. It must be sustainable in economic terms, in environmental terms, uh, in terms of acceptability by our society and so on. It has to be universal, user-friendly, resilient, excellence, and also distinctive because we many times do just me too. 10% here and 10% there different. No, they have to be completely distinctive. And our book actually shows that all these companies, for example, they were successful at a point in time. And here is the criteria for Assured. And they don't exist today because one criteria or the other, as you can see, wherever crosses, they broke. For example, BlackBerry. BlackBerry uh, had something like 80 million customers. They don't exist today. Why? Because when new technology came, Android came, touch technology came, they were still sticking uh, to their emails, uh, I mean, as, uh, making it as an email machine uh, with keyboards, basically, you see. And the users very quickly shifted uh, to the modern technology don't exist. Napster, for example, which you see at the top, free download of music, and they had some 60 million customers. They don't exist. They were affordable because it was zero cost. They were scalable because they were 60 million customers, but they were not sustainable. Why? Because the society of musicians said, you can't download my music for free. So it don't exist. So this is very important when you are doing projects, for example, some of you will become startups, etc. It is very important to use that particular framework. And you can see the assured metrics, for example, Geo. Was it affordable? Yes, four rupees per GB. And why is free? Was it scalable? Yes, it has uh, today almost half a billion customers. Is it sustainable? Yes, they are making profits. Is it universal, user-friendly? You can see this lady and uh, uh, this lady here. What is the uh, difference between the two? She comes from Juggi. She may be driving a Mercedes, but both of them are equally comfortable. 
rapid, yes. They could get 50 million customers within just 83 days. Excellence, yes. When India was having 2G or 3G technology, they gave 4G LT and distinctive. So in order to be successful, you have to see the Azure matrix. Google Glass, a great company, for example, they created Google Glass, but they failed because they were distinctive and excellent, but they did not meet all the other uh, uh, criteria. So it is very important to use that vector. Now, I said what responsible engineer means, what bottleless engineer means, what solution engineer means, what assured engineer means. Now I come to the last part, which is Gandhian engineer. Now you say, what is Gandhian engineer? I'll tell you, I was uh, uh, in Australia when I gave a talk on Gandhian engineering in 2008, 14 years ago. What I said was, Mahatma Gandhi had said that earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not for every man's greed. What it meant was that you have to get more and more from less and less exhaustible resources so that you can preserve them for your children, great-grandchildren, and so on. And I would prize every invention of science made for the benefit for all. That means do it for more and more people. Now you combine them, more from less for more. And this was the talk I gave, Gandhi Engineering. Robin Batamim was the president of uh, the Australian Academy when I proposed this MLM. So it is all about getting more performance from less resource, from more people, MLM. And that Gandhi Engineering mantra spread around the world. In fact, legendary C.K. Prahlad and I wrote a paper uh, which was uh, called Innovations Holy Grail, More from Less for More. And this has found place in 10 must-read papers on innovation. Uh, I've appeared on TED and uh, there were a large number of views. And this lecture has been translated into 23 languages. And then World Economic Forum had a special session on More from Less for More immediately after, within six months, after our paper was published. And I kept on spreading this message of Gandhi engineering around the world. I spoke in Canberra first, then US, Washington, World Bank. They created a project called Vietnam Inclusive Innovation Project, $54 million. I spoke in Asian Development Bank. They created projects on Gandhi engineering. I spoke in Europe, and there it was in Munich and Brussels. Brussels, I addressed the European Commission, spoke in Beijing, several other places, uh, Tokyo and Colombo, Cape Town, uh, Medellin, etc. And of course, you will say that is fine, but what's happening in India? And I'm very happy this model is being picked up by universities. For example, Oro University celebrates Gandhi Jayanti by organizing Gandhi Engineering Idea Competition. More performance from this, so for more people, more poor people, is the model. Uh, this was the news item that appeared. In my mother's name, I created an award for Gandhi Engineering, which has the features of affordability, accessibility, and adaptability. And these have been 11 years, and these have been the winners. And here, the Inclusive Innovation Award, I will explain to you these three awardees, what they have done. For example, when you want to get your hemoglobin tested, what do you do? Somebody comes and pricks you with needles and takes your blood. That's the best practice. Michigan said no. Next practice is non-invasive, no needles. Cost is 150 rupees. He said, I can do it in 10 rupees. And he created a technology, Touch H1B, uh, by which you can see, uh, just you put your finger like this, and you can actually detect your hemoglobin. And then he created even better. He created a camera where you start looking into the camera, and it captures the picture of conjunctiva. 
and use this method of reflectors photometry to estimate the hemoglobin content. Can we just see what dramatic difference it can make to our villages? Because there are no nurses and uh, women don't want to give blood. All range of issues are there. People are, women die of anemia. None of that has to happen. Because all that you have to do is to place a few cameras like this. A rural woman has to come look into the camera and she knows what the hemoglobin is. Uh, let's look at another innovation, and that is the ECG monitor. Normally, if you want ECG electrocardiogram, this is what you do. Best practice is this. But he created the next practice. What is it? You have a hindered device, okay? You hold it like this, put your two thumbs here, and then you have a sensor, put the sensor around your heart, and you can actually uh, get a personal 12 lead ECG event. And two lakh devices have been sold, and he has also made a better device which actually can get you medical grade ECG. And I'm very happy to see that more than two lakhs of these are sold in eight countries. Here you have the breast cancer screen, best practice to nurse practice, because best practice is biopsy, mammography, very painful. He created a test where you have this low-cost tactile sensor that measures tissue stiff difference in real time. It is ultra-portable, accurate, minimal training, wireless, cloud-connected, and instant results. And you can see it is going all over the world now in 25-plus uh, countries. So Indian next practice benefiting the world today. Okay. Uh, look at uh, Sentin, same all. <coughs> in rural villages, the health of a, a pregnant woman is not monitored. So he created something which actually is the IoT-based maternal health care solution that monitors mother's health, 1,000 days care to mother and child for just 1,000. So it is one rupee per day. It can be sort of uh, easily afforded by poor people. And 100 plus villages are served now and is increasing his extent, like Andhra Pradesh uh, has given him a contract to do hundreds of thousands of women. Okay. Now, the important point I want to make is your heart has to be in the right place. What about the Gandhian challenge? Sanitation is more important than political freedom. And sewers are gas chambers where manual scavengers are sent to die. And that was true. Because you could see in the manholes, there were pits, which became death pits, actually. And uh, in that case, 98% uh, of the men and women were diagnosed with fatal disease. And the data was one manual scavenging death every five days. And man in the hole, to robot in the hole, a machine in the hole is what they created. They created a robot which can do the job of uh, manual uh, scavenging. And it was access to dignity. Why? Because when the manual scavengers, their job was replaced by machines, those scavengers themselves were trained as robot operators. Now you can see the difference. The difference is, if this manual scavenger's child was in school, and somebody asked, what does your father do? It would have put its head down and said, he's a manual scavenger. But now it can put its head up and say, he's a robot operator. Can you just imagine these award winners were from a third year engineering college, uh, third year uh, in a degree course, they were in the third year in engineering college. All of you are also there. You are also learning robots. But have you thought of creating such devices which can bring dignity to these poor manual scavengers, saving their lives? So this one, the uh, uh, 2019 uh, Anjani Shilkar Inclusive Innovation Award, you can see the award winner here, Rashid and his two colleagues, basically, 
uh, this is Dr. Vijay Kerkar, myself, and Professor Anil Gandhi, who has been my guru in terms of inclusive innovation. And what has happened as a result of this, of course, there is a bill that was moved uh, for uh, uh, manual scavengers and their rehabilitation. And this uh, manhole cleaning uh, is going to be replaced by sewer cleaning. What it means is that the innovation that you have done as a Gandhian engineer, Gandhian engineer because your heart is in the right place, can transform the society. Now, globally, what people feel engineering can achieve, if you see, currently everybody is worried about climate change. So they say improve renewable energy at the top. And then there are several things, but addressing social inequality is at the bottom. That should not be the case. In fact, this is what has to be at the top. Uh, finally, look at uh, uh, this uh, uh, gentleman who has lost his legs, unfortunately, and the cost of that is $12,000. Can one afford it in India? Of course not. This will be the earnings of a poor man or a woman for years. So what does India do? India creates a $28 foot. And that foot, as a matter of fact, becomes a cover story for a responsible magazine like Time. And you can see what it does. Just see here, for example, just one second. Loading, just hold on. Yeah, you can see this is a Jaipur food patient. For example, see what he does. He goes up the tree. Just see the flexibility in his foot. And then see the strength. What does he do? He jumps. Okay. And then he is asked, did it hurt? He said, not at all. Okay, so he's leading like a normal life. And then what he does is spectacular. Just watch it. He runs. And runs one kilometer in four minutes, 30 seconds. That is fantastic. And normally, if I was physically present there, I know after seeing that, he would have all given up big, big applause. Now, there is a big significance in this. What is the significance? Supposing this man were lost his foot, you have not given him anything at all. And you had asked him to do one kilometer. You would have taken more than one hour to do that because he had to crawl. And then, supposing you had given him a foot, which is a wooden foot, and many people used to use a wooden foot. Would he have been able to run like this? Not at all. He would have crawled. But you gave him something by which he is able to do one kilometer in four minutes, 30 seconds. I've given this lecture around the world, shown this photo, uh, film around the world, and normally I ask, how many of you actually can run one kilometer in four minutes, 30 seconds? And you know, on the average, 1% of hand score, 2% of the hand score. What does that mean? That means he can beat 98% of you. This is Gandhian engineering. Getting more from less for more. Doing affordable excellence. Because it is excellent, he is able to run the way he does. And because it is affordable, just $28, he is able to wear it. That is Gandhian engineering. So that is what is going to be most important for the world. I call it inclusive engineering or an inclusive uh, world where there's a smile on the face of everyone. That's the kind of engineering 
we need to do in terms of future. Let me end my talk by giving you five Mashalkar mantras. Because I'll be touching 80 now on 1st January. I learned a lot in my life and made mistakes as well as learned something good also. So based on that, what I learned. The first lesson is aspirations are your possibilities. Keep them high. But for you as well as for our society. If you aim at Everest, at least you will reach Kanchanganga. But if you aim at Kanchanganga, you will end up on Hanuman Tegri. And if you aim at Hanuman Tegri, you will be where you are. So think big. Second is, particularly for younger generation, I want to say, like instant coffee, there is no instant success. So work hard in silence. Let success make all the noise. In my own life, I work 24 into 7, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Purpose, perseverance and passion matters. It is always too early to quit. Winners are never quitters and quitters are never winners. Fail is first attempt in learning. Because anything new that you do, you are bound to fail. When doors of opportunity, you keep on knocking, don't open, create your own doors, all right? Like when I joined National Chemical Laboratory, we were a very poor country. I couldn't get the imported equipment that I wanted. And uh, I had to wait for two years. So that door was not opening. I created my own doors. I shifted my field. I went into modeling and simulation where the only instrument was my mind, my head. And I'm happy to say that the highest prize that engineering uh, you, you can get, the SS Bhatnagar prize I got within five years. Had I just waited for that door to open, I would still be waiting. So that's what I mean by opening your own doors. And finally, there's no limit to human endurance, achievement, imagination, accepting the ones that you put on your mind. So I'll tell you what I mean by that. You know, this award is called FRS, Fellowship of Royal Society. This is supposed to be the highest award after a Nobel Prize. And in 360 years, there are only two living scientists. One is Professor M.M. Sharma from UDCT. Second is myself, who have been honored like this. The third one, Professor Rodham Narsiva, is no more. It is so rare. And you have the honor of signing in the same book on which, in which Newton has signed somewhere on page nine. And you had an opportunity to actually see that. So I received this honor. And I remember uh, my great guru is Professor M.M. Sharma and Professor Siena Rao. He is a Bharat Ratna. So I phoned him up and I said, sir, I've got FRS. I thought you will jump with joy and congratulate me. He said, not bad. So I was disappointed. Then I got another honor, American Academy of Arts and Science. After 1780, only seven Indians have got it. 200 Nobel laureates have got it. And, uh, you know, people like uh, Charles Darwin, to Winston Churchill, to uh, Einstein, uh, to uh, Nelson Mandela. Who did your top people have got it? So I thought, now you'll be very happy. And I called him. I said, sir, this is what I got. And his response again was, well, not bad. Then I got another honor. U.S. National Academy of Inventors, I was the first Indian. At least in other cases, our third or seventh year, I was first. Now I thought he will congratulate me, he will say, great. He did not. He said, not bad. And then I got upset and I said, what do I have to do to impress you? And his answer that he gave, I'm living with you. He said, Mashelkar, you are climbing on a ladder of excellence, which is limitless. There's no limit excepting the limit that you put on yourself. What it means is that 
whatever you achieve you have to say my best is your to come okay and this you have to do whether you are 18 or 80 so here is my last mantra for you among the five mushal kar mantra every morning you have to get up and when you get up you say my best is yet to come maybe today will be the day so it doesn't matter whether you are 18 19 or 90 keep on doing that and if 1.35 billion indians do it you can just imagine where our india will be it will be not only on the top of the ladder of this innovative excellence it will be among the top few of the committee of nations so all my best wishes and choices blessings are for you for this journey up the ladder of excellence which is limitless and that's the way we can create this atmanirbhar bharat with atmavishwas and this is the responsibility of each one of you to become gen next engineers of the kind that i have described in the lecture thank you thank you very much thank you sir for such an insightful lecture i am sure that i am speaking on behalf of entire audience watching us right now so you have really inspired us with your ground breaking thoughts and added a new perspective to our lives we will sure try to inculcate this teachings of yours in our practice thank you thank you very much and uh, again it has been a great uh, pleasure we started late at 5:15 but we end at the right time at 6 o'clock 5 to 6 really so, sorry for the inconvenience sir that's what we have to do be on time be ahead of time thank you thank you very much so actually uh, we are also having a q and a session uh, there are few questions that audience would like to ask you so we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll wind it off no all right no problem okay sir so here's the first question uh, this goes very back in your college days uh, the question goes like sir you mentioned in an inf- interview that you hated chemistry and uh, later decided to pursue your education chemical engineering after having a conversation with your friend so do you think that school is the school is lacking behind when it comes to help us as students to choose the right career path if yes uh, what things would you suggest to remove this gap yes it is uh, very important to get uh, the right advice and uh, uh, the reason i i didn't exactly hate chemistry i didn't enjoy chemistry put it like that there is no yes. subject that i hate i became the director of national chemical laboratory i can't say i hated chemistry and i became director of national chemical laboratory no yeah i preferred physics and mathematics more put it like that okay yes it was but there is a secret i want to uh, lay before you i had stood second in inter science among uh, i don't know how many students a uh, few thousand students and the first was arun dravid i was second he beat me by three marks i still remember and uh, uh, arun dravid decided to go to iit and i applied for vijay tier and the list had come and i was on the top of the list by the way that was displayed so i could have easily become a mechanical engineer in vijay tier but uh, one day i was start, uh, standing on a bus stop and arun dravid his father was a ics officer and he was driving his own car i was waiting for a bus on a bus stop to catch my bus and he saw me he stopped me he said what are you going to do so i said uh, uh, mechanical engineering in vegetarian then so i said what are you going to do he said chemical engineer and then i asked him i said oh, what is chemical engineering never heard of it then he took me home and his father explained to me that chemical industry is going to be the key industry in time to come it is going to grow and you should never take your decisions based on what you see presently but what you see in the future like i said i only think of the future because that is where i am going to spend the rest of my life 
And then also, uh, Arun David explained to me things like heat transfer, mass transfer, thermodynamics, etc. Where he said it is all mathematics and uh, physical phenomena and the rest of it. So uh, I said fine, and I, it was practically the last day, and I went and actually uh, put in my application there. All right. So I would not have been on this side of the street. I would have been on this side of the street <laughs> if that accident had not taken place where Arundhra uh, had not uh, met me. But having said that, the career guidance, I think there are three things that matter. First is your ability. Second is your attitude. And third is your aptitude. Okay. Ability it is what you learn and the skills and expertise that you develop. Attitude is your behavior. Many people succeed because they're very clever. Their ability is high. But they fail because their attitude is negative, is cynical, etc., uh, etc. Et so you have to develop that. And aptitude, I think early in your life, even in school, basically, we have to understand what one is good at. Otherwise, one will be a failure. And there are a number of ways of doing it. Previously, what, what your parents said, we did. Like, for example, parents said engineering and medicine. They were the top two. Now, today, they are among the few. You can have multiple uh, careers, for example. So the choice has to depend upon your own aptitude. And you must be guided by professionals, not guided by accidents like what I had in my life. Thank you, sir. That was a truly insightful answer. Uh, so also, uh, there's one more question. The question goes like, back in the time when you were completing your education, did you ever feel that, uh, okay, that this amount of education is enough and Let's try to settle and have some money. Why to go for post graduate, post uh, graduation, and PhD in post doctoral? So, what were your thinking at that time? Oh, there, <laughs> it is very interesting. I did not decide that. My mother decided that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and there is a interesting reason. As you know, I was born in a very poor family, and my father died when I was six. I was born in a village called Mashel. And when my father died, my mother brought me to Mumbai in search of a job. And she did small jobs, teaching here, there, whatever would come her way. And two meals a day was a challenge. I walked barefoot until I was 12. I studied under street lights. And in SSC, secondary school certificate board exam, I stood 11th among 1,35,000 students. And still I was going to leave education. Okay. But then I got Tata scholarship, 60 rupees per month, and that is how I could study. That's how I'm here today. Now, in all the journey, my mother had uh, tremendous difficulties and uh, in earning the day-to-day -day bread. And one day, she had gone to Prathana Samaj, where uh, uh, she stood in a queue. And she was denied a job when her turn came because they asked her that the minimum qualification is third standard. Are you third standard pass? Now, there is no certificate for third standard. She could have bluffed, but she has never bluffed in her life. She said, no, I don't have. Then you will have no job. So while she was walking back, she said to herself, I've been insulted. And why have I been insulted? Because I don't have education. So what I'm going to do is give the highest education possible to my son. She did not know what is the highest. So when I did became Eng, she had found out there is a PhD. She said, you must do PhD. When I did PhD, she had found out that there is a postdoctor. So she said, you must do postdoctor. Can you just imagine a lady who didn't have any formal education pushing me on? And there is what are called as honorary doctorate, you know, which universities give. Today I have 45 honorary doctorates. But when I had 25, I remember 
I went to her and I said, I have 25 on the doctors now. Today is my 25. She said, now I'm happy. Now I can go. And then within, I think, three months, she passed away. So she was the motivator behind my higher education, despite herself not being educated. That's the honest answer. Thank you for your answer. I wish that every mother would have the same thinking as you and uh, we'll end this uh, conversation. This has been an amazing session. Uh, we are simply elated to so you could join us today. Also, thank you, our wonderful audience, for tuning in. We hope you all enjoyed the session. I am Suresh Sangpa, and until next time, this is Techno the VGK. All thank you, sir, for joining. We had yeah. wonderful time and your five mantras, Mashelkar mantras will guide us and our students for time is time's immemorial. I think you should uh, take a print. Many places where I have spoken about this, they have taken a printout of this, they have framed it and put it all over the college or institution. Sure, sure. We, should, we would do that. We, yes, we sure. That. We, yeah. we, okay. we would be honored to do that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. you Professor Dawala. Thank you. Just one last request. Uh, we'll